Fresh, Maddie Fresh on the track up his state. And I'm bringing to you live my boys Alec and Nate, Tequila Ty, Jay Nelly, and Dylan in the building. So kick it back, pour the drink. We chillin' because I'm boozing and betting and ballin' like I'm two six in the blue kicks. Watch me move quick. Yeah, it's the blueprint. So who's getting involved? Welcome in to the show. This is booze, bets, and ball, baby. And welcome back to Booze, Bets, and Ball as someone's TV goes off. Um, we're going to get into the Penn State season review in just a minute. But because we have to pay Jay Nelly by the minute for his betting analysis, we have to get him in here quick to get this out of the way. So we are going to do the championship weekend games first before we get into the rest of that stuff. Um, Penn State's not playing in the Big Ten championship game. I don't know if you people knew that or not. The only one of us that picked them to be there was Nate. So that's why he's not here. We kicked him off for being that bad, but it happens. All right, so we're going to get into this. All right, hang on. Let's blow it up. All right, so we got Big Ten Championship game, Michigan minus 17 versus Purdue. I have Michigan covering even without Blake Corum, and then uh, and Nate does as well, and then I'll let the two of you talk about what you went into here. All right, so I got Purdue covering. I mean, there's not much behind it other than I hate Michigan. <laughs> and, I mean, Michigan, like, played Maryland and Illinois really close. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it could be close. You never know. So I'm going with Purdue plus 17. What a real right. analysis from Nelly there. <laughs> I mean, I got Michigan just because they're a much better team. I mean, pretty yeah. obvious. This point in the year, um, I mean, Purdue kept it close with us in the opening game, but if that's played any other point of the year, I think we blow them out. And I just think Michigan's that good of a team at this point. They're rolling even without quorum. They got Edwards, and they're just going to score a lot of points. Yeah, I mean, this team is just riding a huge high from uh, killing Ohio State. Oh, I, I'd be surprised if this game was close. I, I just think this team is in a groove right now. And I really think the only team that could maybe beat them is Georgia at this point. So uh, we'll see what happens there. What do you got? What do you got, Nelly? I don't know, though, because, like, JJ really has shown nothing till last week. Like, I don't trust him. Like, even though he did good last week, yeah, props, whatever. But, like, I need to see him do it consistently. And I don't see Purdue Corum, being the team that does that, though, where they expose them. No, that's true. I don't. It easily cannot be Purdue because they don't have a great defense. I mean, we scored thirty-five on them. So, like, but I think Purdue will cover. All right, fair. I see it. All right, all right, and then we have a SEC championship game, kind of. I mean, similar line, not really similar teams, though. We got 9-3 and three LSU versus undefeated Georgia, 17.5 for Georgia. I'm, I'm giving LSU the points uh, solely at the fact that I think Georgia might get out to like a 35-7 to seven lead in the third quarter and then just take everyone out, and LSU is going to fight to make this game look good. It's kind of where I'm at. I don't know what Nate's thought process was, but he has the the same thing going. So maybe he had the same idea. I think if Georgia wanted to, they could cover. I just think with with the playoff ahead of them, they might take it a little easy in the fourth quarter. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's why I didn't, like 17 and a half. It's just a lot of points. Like that's why I didn't pick LSU. Like I could see Georgia easily going out there and just killing them. But also, I could easily see LSU keeping it within 18 points because that's a lot. Right. And LSU, like, they have athletes on their team. Like, they're a good team. So, like, they could easily keep it close. But, like, I just think the easiest, like, the, the bet to have on this game, just Georgia money line and just parlay it. Yeah, I think we're all kind of thinking on the same boat here. I mean, Georgia's by far the better team, and I don't think anyone expects them to lose this game by any means. But – it's, I think it's going to be a lot like that Tennessee game where they're just going to get out to that lead, cruise, and get ready for the playoffs and get guys playing time. LSU, who knows, will keep it close. But it's really a toss-up of how much Georgia gets out to before they start pulling guys and let LSU creep back into it. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the, the general consensus here. I don't think there's much more to say about that. Georgia, by far, looks like the best team this year. All right, here's a good one. Friday night, I don't know why this one – Page is blurry and the rest of them aren't, but uh, that's just how it is. Friday night, Pac-12 championship game, Utah 
first, USC. USC minus two and a half, but Utah was the only team to beat USC this year, and I'm picking them to do it again. I am the only one taking Utah, but I want to be a little different here. Uh, I don't know. They're a physical team. I think USC is very much of, I don't know, out west Ohio State, and Utah is kind of like, you know, a lesser version of Utah in terms of wanting to be physical, ground and pound type stuff, and I think those finesse teams kind of struggle with that, and I think USC could struggle with it again. Uh, Nate's given or taken the points with USC. He he thinks they'll cover. So, I mean, it's not a lot. Obviously, it could be a three point game at the end of the day. So two and a half, not a lot at all. I mean, yeah, I took USC minus two and a half, but like I'm personally not touching this game. Every time I bet against Utah, they go <laughs> crazy. So mm-hmm. I'm not touching it. Utah, I like what you were saying. Utah, I think, is the team that could come out and beat them again. Like they already did it once. What's stopping them from doing it again? I mean, they did the Oregon last year too, and I didn't think they could do it twice. So I mean, like I could see Utah winning, but I think USC Caleb Williams is gonna make a statement. Jordan Addison, I really haven't heard much from him this year. Just I might be because he's in the Pac-12. Like I don't watch games at 10:30, but like. I think USC with Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison will be too much, and they need to win to get to the playoffs. I think they'll show up and show out. Yeah, I mean, USC is the better team, and they're playing for a playoff point at this point, playoff spot at this point. So I think they're going to win no matter what. I'm going to be that guy, though, and just take them to win because Utah does have a solid <laughs> team. They already beat them. So I'll play it safe, take USC money line, and they're going to go to the playoff. Yeah, for me, this is the only game – of the weekend that is like much of a toss up I, I i think i this is a close one i feel USC like so much more to play for yeah i mean that is true that caleb is williams sure. kind of cemented himself as one of the best quarterbacks in the country if not yeah I, I mean he's yeah. playing he got hot when it's mattered and i think that that is a big thing you cannot overlook to say yeah. that is for sure all right, Big 12, Kansas State versus TCU. TCU getting two and a half. Uh, I'm taking TCU on the money line because I've seen this team play a lot of close games against lesser competition this year. And I to be, the fact that they are undefeated is a blessing for them because I've seen them play with fire many times this year. And Nate has the, the luck running out. Uh, he has Kansas State beating them. Uh, and then I, I think, Nelly, you kind of uh, agree with Nate uh, that TCU's luck is going to run out in this game. Yeah, I mean, I've been a TCU fan, like, this whole year. Like, I'm pretty sure I predicted them to go, like, undefeated, like, a couple like, of yeah. episodes ago. <laughs> like, eight, no. They were, like, 8-0. No. That's why I said they would win the rest of their games. But, like, I just don't – from watching them, they're just not consistent on both sides of the ball ever. Like, there's not a game – where I've seen them consistently be a great team. And I think Kansas State, I mean, they don't, I mean, they've been playing well. I'm pretty sure Martinez is hurt though. So it's a backup QB. But he's been playing well. So I think Kansas State just comes out, knocks him out, knocks him out. TCU's defense secondary just doesn't play well and they get upset. I think it's a statement game for TCU as well. Um, everyone's disrespecting them. They have kind of have been shaky at times, but I think it's time they're just going to come out and show who they really are when this game. I wouldn't be surprised if they win by, like, double digits, just kind of prove a point. Yeah, I, I, I think they have to because, you know, a lot of people think they don't belong in the playoff. Uh, a lot of people think that even a freaking two-loss Alabama should be in over them right now, <laughs> not even if they lose this game. So, yeah, I, I do think they need to come out and make a statement because it's not often we are questioning a 12 and 0 team about making the playoffs. So I, I know you at the TCU knows they have to make a statement. Will they? I, I guess we'll see because I think they're kind of yet to do that in a few games where they could have. Yeah, I was arguing with someone about the Bama thing the other day, but like if you're really thinking about the four best teams, if you it's just so hard to like think about because like if you put Bama versus TCU on a neutral field, who do you think is gonna win? Yeah, I mean Alabama would like, probably yeah, win. Like yeah, Bama yeah. would probably win, but like you can't like just like not credit TCU for beating good teams just because right. they put them close. Yeah, and I think that's why the uh, playoff is expanding in in two years because yeah. of these type of arguments where 
you know, a team like TCU should be rewarded for going 13-0 and and winning their conference. But at the same time, there's a very talented team like Alabama that played some other pretty good teams that lost and maybe they're better than a 13 and 0 team but i in a way you got to reward both of them so i think that's why it's good the the playoff is expanding something that's really stuck with me with tcu is even when uh college game day was there for their kansas game pat McAfee keeps referencing how big this tcu team is yeah and that's for someone that's actually like played in the nfl played at west virginia played like big time football so he knows what he's talking about so i think a lot of us on the outside don't really watch them that close because they're in that big 12 but if People are actually saying how big they are, how physical they are, what a team they are. Like, I think they have something to prove at this point to say, like, hey, we belong here. We're actually going to be 13 and 0 after this game. So put us in the playoff and watch what we can do. Yeah, my, I think that might be what they do. All right, last one ACC championship game Clemson getting or giving seven and a half uh, versus North Carolina. Um, to me, this has less to do with Clemson and more the fact that I think North Carolina absolutely sucks. Uh, give me Clemson minus seven and a half. Nate's on the same train. I don't know how you guys feel. I, I just think this North Carolina team is not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, UNC's defense is terrible. They have Drake May. Who's, I, he's played well this year. Not going to not credit him for that. Downs is a great wide receiver. I mean, UNC really, I don't think they're good. But also Clemson, on the other hand, they – I don't know what's wrong with them. Like, this year, in the past couple of years, they haven't been Clemson. So, I mean, I think it could be close. I'm t- – like, for my parlay, I made – I took the over in this game because mm-hmm. I just think both teams are going to keep scoring, honestly. I could see that. I just I, – Clemson is by far the better team, and it's not really close if you ask anybody. I think Drake Mays is very, very, very good quarterback, and he's going to be able to put up points on Clemson. But, I mean, at the end of the day, if DJ's struggling in the second quarter, he's getting pulled, and they're just going to find a way to get the ball to their playmakers and win this game based off talent alone. So that's why I went money line instead of the points. But, I mean, it very well could be Clemson by, like, 30, too. So. Yeah, I just – I don't know. This North Carolina team, uh, Nate and I talked about them a couple weeks ago when they only had one loss at the time, and I was like, they played one possession games against a lot of really bad teams, including, you know, Georgia State, App State, Duke, Virginia. Like, you know, they they played with fire a lot this year and got away with it up until these last few weeks. And I think, you know, we we're kind of seeing more of what they actually are versus what they were getting away with. That's where having a quarterback like Drake May helps, though, because in those one-score games, you want a quarterback that's very calm, very good, that can get the ball out to the guys and win the game to crunch time. Yeah, I mean, that is, yeah, that's true too. But he's good. I don't think the rest of this team is. Defense, really bad. Uh, you know, Clemson struggled on offense. Defense, especially the defensive line, still pretty solid. I, I just think this is uh, more has to do with North Carolina, just isn't good. But don't forget, North Carolina has our boy Josh Downs, who, according to the <laughs> fighters, should have been a Penn State this year. That, that is true. Should have been here catching passes from uh, Sean Clifford. That is true. Yeah, I know right. this was true, but yep. All right, so that that's gonna do it for our picks here. We have to let uh, Nelly go because he has it. he has a lot he has a Latin exam to study for. So it's the college right. to be on a Thursday. We know what he's doing. Yeah, right, I'll catch y'all. All right, we'll see you. All right, oh, he's a good time. Oh, oh he's good. All right. All right, so that's 14 minutes in. Uh, let's get to what we're actually talking about, and that is Penn State season 10 and 2. Beat Michigan State 35 16 this past Saturday. Uh, got a little close at one point, kind of let the foot off the, the gas a little, I'd say, let Michigan State creep in. Then they come right back, score two touchdown, game over. Good. Not going to complain about it. I, I thought they could win by more, but it, it's whatever at this point. It didn't change anything, honestly. Number eight in the new playoff ranking. That should get them a New Year's six. I don't see how it doesn't. I think Clemson wins uh, this weekend. They'll jump them. Penn State will go back to nine. But because Penn State and Clemson don't fight for the same bowl tie-ins, I, that will not matter at all. Clemson barring something crazy happening up at the top is going to the, the orange bowl and not the playoffs. So I, I think they're kind of locked into where they are. So I don't think, think you have to worry about that, but you know, just going over this season, what, what were your main thoughts on what went down, what didn't go down, you know, that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, overall, this is a very, very successful season. Um, I mean, a lot of people came in with expectations of anywhere from seven and five to nine and three at best, and we won double digit games in the regular season. So, no matter what anyone says, um, it's a very good season for us. But obviously, there was some opportunities to be had. Ohio State, a lot of us think we probably should have won that game. Um, kind of showed at the end why recruiting matters and why getting those top, top tier guys help. Yeah. But, um, I think it's a good place to build at this point. We got a lot of guys coming back next year, and I know the year's not over. We got a probably a pretty big bowl game, like you're mentioning, coming up. But it's it's as good as a year as anyone could have hoped for. Um, besides the super optimistic people that were hoping for the 12 and 0, 11 ones every year. Yeah, it's it's the super optimistic people, and then the people that aren't optimistic, they're negative, but they're like negative in a sense where they expect 12 and oh like it it's hard to explain but there's people that are like oh i won't settle for anything else you know like those kind of people the people that need everything or nothing i guess is the best way to put it i yeah i mean i thought they were going nine and three i thought ohio state and michigan were kind of lock lock losses and then i kind of thought we would kind of get the penn state special somewhere along the line I know like I put it out there as Auburn. I didn't actually think it was going to be Auburn. I thought it was going to be something really stupid that they were going to lose. And thankfully, they avoided that. And, you know, the big thing for me is they got blown out by Michigan, and they looked really good the rest of the year after. Like, they come back the next week. I know it was the wideout, but they beat Minnesota 45-17. And then, you know, realistically, they played Ohio State as good as maybe they've played them since 2018. And, you know, they they could have won that game. And even though they blew that game at the end, that didn't, you know, beat bother them either. And I think they they beat the rest of their opponents by something like 21 points was the margin of victory then over the last four games. Like, they, they got better as the year went on, which was good to see. And the fact they got better as the year went on is promising because a lot of the guys that contributed, like you said, were young. There were a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys coming back. Oil Fashanu, who was actually hurt during those last few games, the left tackle is projected to go in the first round coming back. Like there's outside of Clifford, I, you know, Joey Porter Jr., Mustafer, Strange, we think, you know, Parker Washington, maybe, and Jair Brown. Like a lot of the guys who carried like the bulk of the weight for this team are expected back next year. I mean, let's talk sound crazy like those guys are some big time losses but yeah. i think we have the recruiting in place and the players on the roster that it's not going to hurt us as it would in let's say after 2019 when we went to mm-hmm. 2020 and it was kind of scary when we got razor thin so we're losing some big time players that's going to happen to any major program that is successful and recruits well but we have the players that have the opportunity to evolve into the players that we're losing so it's a very optimistic time for Penn State football. It's a great time to be a fan. Um, a lot to look forward to. But overall, this year went really, really well, I think. As good as we could have hoped for. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, they survived Purdue, which a lot of people actually thought they might lose. Uh, that was, I guess, the most entertaining game of the year, considering every other game, I, Nate and I were talking about this, was every other game this year was pretty much a blowout outside of, you know, I guess Ohio State looked like a blowout at the end, but it really, it really wasn't. I mean, pretty much every other game was non-competitive, one way or the other. So, they, you know, they survived that game, and then I thought th- I thought they looked good. I was, I wasn't surprised really by what Nick Singleton did. I thought Katron Allen looked a lot, a lot better than I imagined because I I did think Kevon Lee was still going to figure into the rotation. I don't know if he was hurt or what happened or what's going on there. He's technically, I guess he's still with the team, but didn't play a lot. Uh, And I think, you know, with Katron Allen, it kind of comes down to play at IMG. You're a little more ready than everyone else. And that's kind of what it looked like to me because he looked more like a sophomore or junior back there. Not not just running the ball, but pass catching, blocking, that kind of stuff. Exactly. I think programs like IMG, this is where it helps getting those players because they come in with basically a year or two, whatever you want to say, for um, of college experience because that's how they run these programs. It's They're in dorms, they're practicing, they're lifting weights almost every day, they're with coaches and meetings, they understand how to watch film. So it's all those little things that a lot of freshmen need to take that year to learn of how to do, like especially 
some fans are not going to like this, but it was good for Drew to have Cliff this year because he kind of showed him how to do those little things that are going to help a lot on Saturdays. And a lot of people say this for coaches, but it's true for players too. The games are most likely won from Monday to Friday, getting ready for the week or Sunday to Friday. And then mm-hmm. Saturday, it's if you prepared well enough, usually the cards play out how it should. So I think it's big getting those players from these high schools that teach them how to do these things really early on, and they come in and be able to contribute or contribute right away um, to this team and help them out. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you brought up Aller. A lot of people, my my mentions were kind of flooded this week with when I said that I thought this season was successful. And there are people that come in and be like, I would have rather have went eight and four, seven and five, and let Aller take every snap. And that is just that's a loser mentality. And these people were trying to be, or the same ones telling me that they're not happy unless it's like 12 and 0 and you beat Ohio State and Michigan. They're the same people telling me they'd rather go eight and four and give Allah every snap. So I don't understand that. But I, I thought they did a really good job of getting Aller in there when they could. I, I you know, I, there could have been some times maybe in second quarters where they gave him a drive and just, you know, saw how it went. But we mentioned Drake May earlier, and we've talked about C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. Those three guys were maybe the three best quarterbacks in college football this year. Aller threw 59 passes this year. That is more than the three of them threw combined their true freshman years, and all three of them had fantastic second years. So if Drew Aller is as good as his ranking says he is, and from what we see, you know, the little bits we saw that he looked pretty good, like 59 in-game pass attempts as a true freshman should be enough. We should not be using that as a complaint next year if things go bad. Yeah, I mean, the way I see it is if you played him this whole year, there's a no-win scenario from that because let's say we go 7-5 and five and he's getting hit constantly, That's gonna it's going to be Hackenberg 2.0. And yeah. I still have my whole thing on this, and I think he would have been a whole different player if he didn't have to get hit and go crazy his freshman year. But – Different, different subject. Um, but I mean, for Aller, it's just not playing time. He learned from, as much as people don't want to admit it, a really solid college quarterback in Sean Clifford, who, sure, his on the field and his talent may not be that great. And I mean, it's better than most, but it's not like amazing. It's not going to be Heisman winning first round NFL draft pick. Mm-hmm. But all the little things he does right. He knows how to read the defense. He knows how to prepare. He knows what's coming. Make those checks at the O line. Uh, switch a play if he needs to. And Alar getting a year to see that and learn how to do that, command a team. I mean, you see just here from the players when he first showed up, he was a quiet kid that you could barely hear him call the cadence. And by the end of the year, you saw him doing the same thing Clifford does: is barking out orders and getting players in the right area. So it was such a beneficial year for them. Plus, with Penn State going 11-11 the last two years. You needed to have a winning year this year. Like you right. could not go seven and five. Franklin would be on the hot seat. Fans would be restless. Like these same fans that are calling for Alar and say they would have been okay with seven and five, they would be going ape shit right now on the fact that we went seven and five. So this was such a monumental year that they needed and to get back to the program that Penn State's trying to get to again. Exactly. And kind of bring up uh the point you made on Clifford. I, I think Sean Clifford is arguably like the perfect quarterback to learn from because he is a six-year guy he's been around the block he knows everything to do from you know Sunday to Friday as well and ordering you know in terms of preparing and working out and you know getting schoolwork done and that kind of stuff too but I think also the fact that he's not a perfect quarterback on Saturdays is almost beneficial because Drew could look at the things that Sean does right and mimic them and he could also look at the things he's done wrong and be like okay I can't do that like when it's my turn or I, I can do that differently. And I, I think it's maybe more beneficial to learn from someone like that than someone like a Bryce Young or, you know, Drake May, who's making every single throw. And you're just kind of like, oh, well, I have to go out there and be as amazing as them. I think it's a little better when you learn from somebody who maybe you have more talent than, and you could kind of learn from their mistakes while they're also learning from their mistakes. It's also inevitable in football that, I mean, shit's going to happen. It's not going to go well and we're going to be upset. So, as dumb as this may sound, it's kind of good for him to see how Clifford handles that pressure from the yeah. fans acting poorly and booing him and in the media when they're asking him these hard questions because he got to see it firsthand. I mean, look at C.J. Stroud. They just got blown up by Michigan two years in a row, and people were asking him what it feels like not going to a Big Ten championship ever or Bryce Young after losing to Tennessee and LSU this year. Like, It's going to happen no matter where you are and who you are and how good you are. So 
I think that too, just seeing how someone of his six years and learning how to navigate the media and navigate the fans and working with the coaching staff to prepare still and keep in a clear head, like that's going to pay so much dividends in the long run for this team. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, offense, I, I don't know what's going to happen at receiver. I don't know if Parker Washington is coming back. We know Mitch Tinsley's gone. I, I think they're going to bring in two transfers at least. And, you know, I could see them not – getting another receiver in the 2023 recruiting class and just being like, all right, let's, let's get uh, transfers because we're trying to win the next two years with Aller and Singleton and Allen and Carter and all these guys. Like I'm not, you know, they're not worried about 2025, 2026 yet. So I, I do think they'll be even more aggressive than they were last year in the transfer portal offense. I, I think totally fine. I, I thought it was pretty good this year. I mean, they average, almost 36 points per game which was top 20 in the country like that's good it's good it's not elite but it's it's good and it helps when the defense was really good i mean they only gave up 18 points per game they were really good against the run i think they gave up 102 first to run obviously we know they they led the country in past defense past breakups all that kind of stuff i thought manny diaz had a really good year um you know, like it says they gave up 31 to Purdue. They get the the defense gave up 24, Clifford threw a pick six. Like they they struggled for about 10 minutes in that game where they gave up two touchdowns on two straight drives, and then they were great the rest of the game. And then you get to Michigan, and I thought they held their own up until the fact that the offense couldn't move the ball and they got tired because they were out there for over 40 minutes and just kind of were gassed. And then Ohio State was, you know, the offense turned the ball over four times, which didn't help. I, I think this defense didn't lose them any games. I don't know. I don't know if they really won them any games either because a lot of these games were blowouts. But, I mean, this defense from the turnovers, the sacks, and all the stuff in between, they have they were exciting and they played as well as I think we've seen any defense here play. Yeah, and I think it's just the nature of Manny's defense. It's going to take time for everyone to gel when you're going to be coming with those pressures and those exotic blitzes. And it's just it's something you got to feel comfortable in. I think it's a good team to like have a first run with it, with having Brown at safety, Musfer on the line, uh, Jacobs, and even I guess you could say Sutherland and the linebackers. Like Those guys are experienced guys with a lot of ball that definitely helped bring this along. Um, but even with them being there, it's going to take time no matter what. And Diaz – you could see kind of more as a year, everything started clicking more. And I don't think we got as many turnovers as some of us kind of thought we could with the team, but they really took teams away from what they wanted to do at times. And it made it difficult for the teams to have anything to succeed with. And it put our offense in a lot of successful positions to score the points. So I think it just took time. It's going to connect. Um, he has a whole nother off season as long as he stays. And I think this is going to just continue to grow on what they already did this year. Yeah, you know, I, I think he's going to stay. Uh, he was a finalist for the FAU job. They went another direction today. So I, I think really he's only a threat for Florida jobs, I think, which is funny because he's up at Penn State right now. But yeah, if he's back next year, that'll be great. And I also think with the way his defense is, that might, you know, lean some guys to come back another year, someone like Adisa Isaac or Curtis Jacobs. And it might you know, peak the interest of some guys thinking about going the portal and are like, okay, well, I could get a ton of sacks or a ton of picks if I go to Penn State. And I think we might see a couple, you know, big time players from around the country end up here on defense for next year because a lot of guys look good. And, you know, they didn't get a lot of turnovers, I guess, as, as many as we expected, but no one threw at Joey Porter Jr. So he had absolutely no chance to get any interceptions this year because I think after the Purdue game, when him and Charlie Jones went back and forth for a little bit, no, no one really threw at him the rest of the season after that. So, I mean, that was just, it was remarkable to him because there was like 10 weeks. He didn't hear his name once. Yeah. I know he, missed, he didn't, he missed a couple games, but there were, there were like eight games he played and you didn't hear his name once because no one looked his way. Yeah. I mean, back to the transfer. I think that's really where this class, so I guess of 2023 is going to finish up. Because I know we're going to be pretty limited on these spots. I'm sure we're going to lose some guys, which is going to stink. But and we got to be very selective at this point. Because like you said earlier, this team has a lot of chances to compete for 23, 24, um, I guess even 25. But I think they need to bring in instant game changers in positions of need. So 
possibly bring in those receivers, like you said, bring in definitely another linebacker just for death purposes of anything. It doesn't need to be a starter. Um, I mean, it may even bring in like another corner, but mm-hmm. I think that's where they really got to look and be selective and find these guys that the portal is going to be something huge this year. We all know it's coming. It's going to be mass exodus everywhere. So Manny being there for another year and seeing how well his defense thrives, seeing Joey Porter probably go in the first round, seeing Kalen King with his insane PFF rating. Jair Brown's probably going to be a second, maybe third round pick. Uh, Mustafer is going to go, I want to say pretty early. So as we got studs that showed out how good this defense can be, and it's going to attract guys to come play in it. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think a lot of people want to play in this defense. And I think on offense, a lot of people might want to play with Drew Aller. And honestly, I think some offensive linemen might want to get coached by Phil Trotwine because that unit was probably not probably, I mean, the running backs, maybe the most improved unit from last year, but you know, the offensive line where Olio Fashanu, we see him in the Outback Bowl, and I was like, all right, he, you know, he held his own. He looked pretty good. And then by week five of this year, people are talking about being my first round draft pick. And I was like, whoa. And then I learned he was 19, which I had no idea he was 19. But that's <laughs> that's that's impressive, too, to be draft eligible at 19, by the way. But yeah, him, and I just, I just think the whole group, the group as a whole, because I mean, they were kind of banged up. Like, Caden Wallace missed, missed a bunch of time. Landon Tangwell was gone for the year halfway through like they were banged up and they still held in there and i think outside of jtt because i'm not trying to pronounce his name on ohio state killing them like no one really gave that group a hard time all year outside of one guy who was the number one player in his class yeah i was a little nervous after the ohio game because they had i would think like three or four sacks but Mm -hmm. after that they really got together and they gelled um trotline i think this was a hell of a coach and i don't know why people were so quick to get on him after Mm -hmm. Boy, this is second or third year. This is uh, the Kobe year was his first year, I think. So it's his third, it's third year. year. But I mean, you finally see what he gets his recruits in. He can get time with them and work with them. Those guys balled out and yeah. the running back certainly helped. But if you can see anywhere with no matter how good the running back is, you need a good O-line to make anything. So mm-hmm. those guys, fantastic. Could it be better? Absolutely. You can always improve. But from where we've been accustomed to the last couple of years for Penn State football on the O-line, those guys played fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you talk about improving too. I We expect pretty much every impact guy except Juice Scruggs to be back next year with Fashano saying he's back. Kane Wallace is maybe iffy, but Tangwell should be back. Wormley should be back. Norzad already said he's coming back. And then you know, you have Shelton who played really good when Fashanu was hurt coming back. And then you add two borderline five stars from the 2023 class are coming in. Like there, there's a lot of talent there. And like maybe Nelson too. Yeah. Which yeah. Yeah. Insane how much we actually have depth at Penn State in the O-line, which is something we haven't had in a while. No. Yeah. This is the first time since before the sanctions that I think you really feel good about Penn State's offensive line, not only the starting group, but if someone gets hurt, like, you feel good about the guy stepping in too, which we have Franklin's never felt that way. And I think that is, you know, he always kind of early on in like 16 and 17, people were like, how come you didn't break through the playoffs? And he always kind of pointed at, I had no line depth. I had, I had no depth at this position because I was still reeling from that. And I think he's finally in a position where he's pretty deep across the board. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's time to put up or shut up. If it's Franklin. So. Yeah. He had a great 10 and two year. He bounced back over these last couple of years. And I think some of us kind of knew these last couple of years were a fluke. Some of us were a little worried about where we were going, but he's got the recruits. He's got the team. He's got the coaches. I think as long as we don't lose anyone too important, um, it's really time to see where we go. Finish the year strong this year with hopefully a Rose Bowl win. Um, and then just build onto it for 2023. Yeah. I mean, that would be uh That'd be the best way to go. So before we close it down, I guess what was, uh, what do you think you learned the most from this team this year? Not only for this year, but going forward. What do you think I learned the most? Um, (laughs) Penn State football will never, never not be my favorite thing in the world. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. No matter how much I was upset after the Michigan game or the Ohio State game, I mean, hell, I still had a, bunch of fun with all my friends going up there the environment's always crazy franklin i love him to death as much as he goes to be great 23 but it's it's a great time to be a penn state fan right now yeah i 
you know, for me, I guess I learned to trust them, trust the coaches and stuff when they say stuff like Franklin talking about, well, I, like, I'm not going to tell you the offensive line is going to be better. Like I'm going to show you it. And then he did. And, you know, talking about the impact the running backs were going to have, and then, you know, kind of standing by that. Yeah. Like I'm starting Sean Clifford this year, like where Aller's going to play, but let's like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And so that was one thing I learned. And then the second thing was, I think, I don't know if it, maybe it's the impact of Manny Diaz. Maybe it's just a change in, who was in the locker room or a change in what Franklin's doing. But they, like I mentioned earlier, they didn't, they didn't blow up when they, uh, when they lost a couple games, they, they stayed going and they stayed hot. And we, that is something we have not really seen in past years. And I, I think to me, that is the number one, like good sign for the future that they, it kind of looked like they took a step forward. And maybe it's because they played a bunch of young guys who, you know, weren't used to losing, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, so like they didn't care and like still wanted to go out there and play. And if you just have a bunch of guys out there that just want to go out and play and have fun, you're going to win probably more than the guys that have all the pressure in the world, like Bryce Young, who ended up losing two games this year, and CJ Stroud, who didn't beat Michigan again. You know, the guys that had pressure maybe, you know, didn't, didn't do what they were supposed to. So maybe it's better to kind of fly under the radar and, you know, get in there and do whatever you can. And especially after they start this season unranked to be eight right now, I think is uh, pretty remarkable. Oh yeah. And then building off that too, I think this team is the first time since like the 16, 17 teams where you can really tell these guys cared about each other. And I think that mm-hmm. could be way. And the same reason that you're talking about Manny Diaz coming in, but after a blowout loss, I remember seeing in 2016, how Saquon and Marcus was talking about like, Hey, we're never having this feeling again. And they went on those runs and sure. They still lost two games in 17, the Rose bowl at 16, but you could tell how much they cared and loved each other. And they were still putting out those videos. They were hyped to be playing together. Like they were taking care of each other. Someone messes up, someone else had their back. And I didn't feel that the last couple of years with this team. And you could really tell that this year, um, especially with even all the nonsense from the fans towards Clifford, you could see guys like coming out and supporting him and, uh, even after Singleton's fumbles, we were supporting those running backs still. So, like, you could really tell this team cared about each other and they had each other's backs no matter what. Yeah, I'm for sure. Uh, last thing before we go, uh, really funny thing that really flown under the radar, but as far back as I could check, Sean Clifford completed 63.6% of his passes this year, which somehow is the highest completion percentage by a Penn State quarterback in a season. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's Sean. career, buddy. <laughs> There's that. Uh, yeah, people give him all you want. And he's somehow the most accurate passer in Penn State history, which is kind of crazy, I guess, to think about. But considering everyone says he misses every throw and somehow he's the most accurate quarterback they've ever had, which is funny. But yeah, that is a uh, that was something I found that was kind of interesting, too. That's a hell of a stat to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, I, just funny considering the way this people looked at his season that that's well, how, how it please is. go like four of 18 or something like that in the Rose Bowl. <laughs> yeah, ho- hopefully. Yeah, I, I, I think he's playing in that. I, I think he said that. Uh, yeah, he came maybe, out definitely playing. Yeah, maybe that's when they split some stuff, like Aller gets in a little more. We'll see. But I, I, the game, I think Franklin wants to win the Rose Bowl. And I think at the same time, Sean's earned the right to go out like this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like, agree. Down 21 and he's playing like dog shit. Yeah, they're going to pull Yeah, him. Yeah. It, if it's a close game and he's playing at least decent, he's staying in that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I see that. All right. Well, we are going to wrap this up before Nate gets out of wherever the hell he is. So he's going to miss this. Unfortunately, I'll come back. I'll come back with him next week. We'll talk about some stuff. Cause I'm sure he'll have some crazy stats and stuff to tell us about. So uh, we'll do that then. All right. So thanks for watching this episode. Uh, you know, like subscribe because I have to pay Jay Nelly by the minute because it's that good. So, you know, you, you got to help me out. But uh, all right. Thanks. We'll see you next.